I'm filming this on the 7th of December, 2020. Back in 1941 on December 7th, you'll remember, I hope, the Japanese launched a surprise naval air attack on Pearl Harbor. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, asking Congress for a declaration of war the following day, referred to December 7th as a date that will live in infamy. Unfortunately, he was wrong. People have forgotten Pearl Harbor. Let me explain. Back in mid-August 1998, I was sitting in a movie theater in Atlantic Beach, North Carolina with my ex-wife, then wife. We were there to see Saving Private Ryan. And uh, I think it's the only movie theater in Atlantic Beach. I can't remember the name of it. It It's a new movie at the time. Steven Spielberg. Tom Hanks. Good film. Behind us were a young couple. From the conversation I wasn't so much listening to but couldn't help but overhear, I would say they were, you know, in their early 20s. And they both appeared to be college students. I don't know where they were going to school. It could have been East Carolina. It could have been UNC Wilmington. could have been any number of other places in the state or outside the state. But they were there to watch the film, as were we. When the film begins, you can remember, the if you've seen it, the opening scene is the cemetery, and then they flash back to D-Day and the horrors on the o- Omaha beach, the men getting slaughtered, which goes on for a few minutes. Reality, of course, went on for a couple of hours. Uh, I, I, I interviewed a couple people who were there uh, during my life as a historian. Pretty horrible day for them. But at some point, they did break through, as they do in the movie. They, they blow away with Bangalore torpedoes through the, the, uh, the seawall, and they get her in and around behind the Germans, who just basically had a crust defense. They break the crust, they get behind them, and the Germans all come running out of their bunkers because they know now it, it's all over, and they got their hands up yelling, you know, Nick shoots and Nick shoots, don't shoot, don't shoot, comrade, comrade. And the Americans proceed in the movie to shoot a bunch of them, which actually happened. And, and you'd understand it more if, if, you know, if you had watched all the horror scenes that you had seen in the previous several minutes, imagine if it had gone on for hours what those men felt like when they finally get off the beach. But that's really not the point here. So let me let me go on before I digress too much. The young woman says to the young guy, why are we always doing this? Why are we always invading countries and massacring people? And he, to his credit, said, no. No, you got it all wrong. In her mind, this movie was another version of Platoon. It's just set somewhere in Europe with Europeans. You know, it's, it's the Americans are invading. These people are trying to surrender. They have their hands up and they're being shot. They're being massacred. It's a war crime. Those ugly Americans, why do they do these horrible things? But he explains to her, no, there were Germans. They had invaded France and we're there trying to push them out of France to liberate the French people. And he starts talking, you know, they were the Nazis and all that stuff. And it, it struck me immediately that this woman, who is in college, probably you know went through the UNC or North Carolina State public school system, K through 12, or maybe some other public school system, doesn't understand anything about D-Day. And the first thing that hit me was, you know, I wonder when, when Spielberg made this movie, did he consider the possibility that there are people in the audience, the young people, who don't have a clue of the context of what's happening on D-Day. They don't know anything about it. They don't understand it. They don't know why we were there. They don't understand anything. And I wondered to myself, did it ever, did he ever consider that possibility that there are people in the audience who are clueless? And then the second thing, somewhat related, jumped into my own mind. Because the next week, I had to go back to Greenville and start teaching. And one of the courses I was teaching was History 1050, survey course, first half of U.S. history survey course. And my thought was, you know, what do I assume the students know? I mean, I had two kids went through the public school system. I know what they're supposed to have learned. But have I ever assumed that the students sitting in front of me, and at this point, I'd been teaching 
it's my eighth year there. And I'd been teaching back into the 80s and other, at other schools teaching U.S. history. I had never considered the possibility that I would have to explain why we were invading France on D-Day or any number of other things. When I got back home, I, I think class started on a Monday that year, if I remember correctly. My first class wasn't until Tuesday. So I had some time. And what I did was I put together a quiz. And what I decided to do on the first day of class, I would hand out index cards. And I had a big bundle of index cards. I give everybody an index card. And I would tell them, to, I was going to give them this, I think there were 10 questions on the quiz. And it wasn't multiple choice. They had to actually write in the answer or just write, you know, clueless or I don't know or leave it blank. I didn't ask them to put their names on it. So they're not going to get graded on it. There's no penalty if they do poorly. I said, and I, actually I told them this story about, you know, D-Day and the movie and the girl behind me. And I said, you know, I, I just want to know what you know. So I know what I can assume that you know and what I should assume that you don't know before I begin this class. So I gave him the quiz. I think there were like around 45 students in there. I think the maximum capacity of that room was 48. And there were always a couple of people missing. So I probably had, you know, say roughly four dozen students in there. I asked where they were from. And of the 48 students I had, 46 were from North Carolina. 46 had gone through the North Carolina public school system. Two were from uh, uh, Ocean County, New Jersey. For some reason, ECU recruits well in Ocean County, New Jersey. And I can't remember all the questions, but I can remember some of them. And one of them was on Pearl Harbor. I asked them, what was Pearl Harbor? Simple enough question. It blew me away that night when I got home and I checked the answer. Roughly four dozen students had attempted to answer it. The majority left it blank. About seven correctly identified it as the spot where the Japanese launched a sneak attack against the Americans on, at Pearl Harbor, 7 December 1941. Seven out of over, you know, close to 48, maybe 45, 46 were there that day. Uh, seven. Other than that, the number one answer beyond clueless, I don't know, I don't, I have no clue. The number one answer that I got from the students, which, and it was, it was in the high teens. Pearl Harbor was where World War II began. Okay, that's good. When the United States dropped a nuclear bomb on Japan. So basically, I had about a dozen and a half students in the class, the plurality of the people who answered the question, I think that's the right term, who believed that Pearl Harbor was where we opened World War II with a sneak nuclear attack against Japan. Where in the hell did they get that from? That night I went home, and as I went through all the other answers, I was entirely blown away. Like one of the answers, and again, all but two of the students were from North Carolina. The question was, who was the president of the Confederacy? Now, these are North Carolinians, you know, they're proud Southerners, if you ask any of them. Tar Heels, you know, ball caps, Confederate flags on their pickup truck, all that stuff. One young woman got it right, Jefferson Davis. In case you don't know who the president of the Confederacy is, it was Jefferson Davis. Correct answer from Mississippi, former Secretary of War. Number two was, oh, number one, I actually was, I don't know. They didn't have a clue. She got it right. She was alone, one person out of almost four dozen. The number one answer I got was a majority, but the number one answer was Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was president of the Confederacy. I think a dozen people thought that. One person thought it was Jefferson Davis. A dozen thought it was Abraham Lincoln. Number two, which even blew me away more, was the president of the Confederacy was William Tecumseh Sherman. General Sherman was president of the Confederacy. Next one down was U.S. Grant was president of the Confederacy. 
And then it was Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and there was one other one. It might have been Joe Johnston. But uh, the majority of the class had no clue who he was. And actually, if you look at it, only one out of roughly four dozen students had it right. One out of four dozen North Carolinian college students knew that Jefferson Davis was president of the Confederacy. I don't remember all the questions I asked, but I remember a couple of them. Who did we fight in the American Revolution? The majority, the number one answer, and a majority answer was, we fought the blacks. The American Revolution was about race. It was a race war. I know where they picked that up. They picked that up in other classes from the high school teachers who were taught at American universities. The revolution was, it was just about race. Everything in this country is about race. So the American Revolution was a race war, us against the blacks, the whites against the blacks. I asked them, who do we fight in the War of 1812? <laughs> Same answer, the blacks. One of my favorites was, who did we fight in the Mexican War? You know, that's the question like, you know, what color was uh, George Washington's gray horse? Who did the United States fight in the Mexican War? Want to make a guess? Yeah, the blacks. Why? Because they're taught by their teachers, well, the Mexican War was all about race and the extension of slavery. And in their confused minds, that means we were fighting black people. I mean, I, you know, they, I know it's a more sophisticated argument than that. But you have to understand when you give people a very sophisticated argument, it gets garbled. You know, you're not talking to fellow historians or fellow social studies teachers. You're talking to kids and it just gets jumbled into God knows what. In this case, race. Who did we fight in World War I? The Germans. Oh, okay. That's good. But not a majority of the students were able to answer that. That was the, you know, most of the students who answered it got it right, Germany. Who did we fight in World War II? The Japanese. And when I came back the next day, actually two days later when I taught again, I asked them about that. And basically, in general, the students in my class, the four dozen students in my class, virtually all products of a North Carolina public school system, believed we fought Germans in World War I. Scenes that they saw in movies or documentaries with the Germans with their Stahlhelms, you know, the uh, call bucket, call scuttle helmets that they wore, they were all World War I. You know, uh, Saving Private Ryan was in World War I because you had Germans there and they had those funky helmets. That was World War I. World War II was Sands of Iwo Jima with John Wayne fighting the Japanese. There were two wars. There was the German War, World War I, and the Japanese War, World War II. They had, I, I think there were two people out of 48 who understood that in World War II we were fighting Germans and Japanese and Italians. I mean, nobody knew anything about the Italians. I asked them, one of the questions was, what are the dates of the Second World War? Now, I would have, you know, 41, 45, 39, 45, start the war in China, go back to Manchuria, 31, you know, any of those in the ballpark. I think only about 10 students got the right century. I had students telling me it was the 17th century, the 16th century, the 18th century, the 19th century. They couldn't get World War II in the right century, let alone the right decades. That's the knowledge they were bringing to class. And I should add another anecdote. This isn't this class. This was a different class. I made a reference one time in one of my lectures. I was talking before the, Civil, the American Civil War, and I made a reference to the Civil War in 61, 65. And when the class was over, a, a young African-American woman came up to me, and she had her notepad out. And she's, she's looking at her notes, and she's got her pen. And she says, I need some clarification. I said, yeah. She said, you said there was a civil war from 61 to 65. What century was that in? And I think to myself, my God, how did this woman get through? I asked her, you know, where are you from? She told me she was from Fayetteville or someplace, North Carolina. Public schools, yeah. She didn't know. She didn't seem to even know that we had had a civil war until I mentioned it, and she didn't know what century it was in. From that point on, I realized I had to change all my teaching because I realized I couldn't assume that they knew anything 
as background. I, ha I had to treat my courses as if I was teaching young adults who had never had a history course in their lives. Because as far as I was concerned, whatever they were taught or not taught in their K through 12 education, and the overwhelming majority of the students at ECU, at least when I was teaching there, were from North Carolina. They might as well not have gone to school as far as I was concerned with regard to social studies. I mean, these are, I'm not asking them, I wasn't asking them sophisticated interpretive questions. You know, how would you interpret the causes of the Cold War or something? You know, I asked them, who, who were we fighting in the American Revolution? You know, what century did World War II take place in? You know, that the idea that I think seven times, eight times as many people believed that General Sherman was president of the Confederacy than the, the one young woman who knew it was Jefferson Davis was to me incredible. I, it, it's, it makes me really wonder. And remember, this was more than 20 years ago. And I can tell you from experience teaching, which only ended last May, it's worse today. I couldn't go into class when I was teaching last year and assume they knew anything about anything. I make references. To, what's that? I made a reference to the Great War once in a, uh, a lecture, a video I did on a, in a uh, online course. I got a flood of emails. Uh, what's the Great War? You know, they never heard of the Great War. I had to say World War One, the First World War. Oh, oh, okay. You know, I mean, how do you get through elementary school, middle school, high school, and get into college? This was a graduate course I was teaching, by the way, a graduate course, and not know what the Great War was. Never, never heard of a Great War. When you start trying to figure out what's happening in this country today why people can misunderstand things like the, why the Senate looks the way it does, why our court system looks the way they are, you know, why we have an electoral college, what's the Second Amendment. Remember, you're not dealing with people who are in possession of a full deck of American history cards. They've got, you know, a couple of deuces is basically what they come armed with, most of these people. And, you know, the thing that always troubled me was East Carolina University, where I taught, was known primarily for two things. Uh, I mean, I'm not talking about being a party school. I'm not talking about certainly being a football powerhouse. It cranks out nurses. I think it's got the biggest nursing school in the state. And it does a very good job of cranking out nurses. And I, as far as I know, they crank out very good nurses. They're also known for cranking out teachers. ECU produces more K-12 teachers than any other institution in the state. If you're taught in North Carolina, the odds are probably better than even that your teacher got his or her degree at East Carolina. And that's what scared the hell out of me. Because if these kids don't know anything, if they know that little, and what little they know is that distorted, it's because their teachers don't know. And if their teachers don't know, the K-12 teachers don't know, whose fault is that, if not the institution where I taught? You know, it's an old Sicilian saying, and I am Sicilian. My original name was Palermo, not Palmer. A fish rots from the head. And if you want to look at the problems with Americans not understanding their history, let alone other people's history, you know, you have to understand that it starts at the head and the head is our institutions of higher education in this country. That's my experience. Think about it. Leave a comment. Give it a thumbs up. Share it with your friends. Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Subscribe to the channel. Appreciate that. And until the next time, keep fighting.